that the writer of Hebrews has been dealing with the superiority of Christ who is after the order of Melchizedek as we have spoken of and the superiority of his priesthood to the superiority of the Levitical priesthood that began with Aaron. As we said, Aaron's priesthood and the line that came after him was established and was designated by God. He was appointed. But the writer of Hebrews, in writing this to these Hebrew believers, is making emphasis to the fact that Christ's priesthood is better. Christ's ministry is better. And best of all, Christ's sacrifice is better than those of the Levitical priesthood under the law. And as we have said before, the law, as we have looked at the Scriptures, is holy and just and good. But the fault in the law is not with God or in the law itself, but it is in man and in his sinful nature and in his inability to perform that which God commanded. So what we find here is in Hebrews 7 and what we will find as I, as I look ahead to the chapters ahead of us in just like spiritually speaking makes my mouth water and to see the powerful truth that is there for us. And so we come down to this and we, in verse 25 last week, that great verse there speaking, He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him since He always lives to make intercession for them. We don't have to worry about some sin being not forgiven. He saves to the uttermost. He saves from the top of your head to the sole of your feet and from eternity past to eternity future. There is nothing undone. He saves to the uttermost. And so now he speaks of our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And begins here by saying such a high priest was fitting for us. Now, what does that mean? That he was fitting for us. Well, the phrase here means he is proper. He is one who is in this way or in a way that is complete in every respect who is fully fitted for the task. Christ is complete in every way to be our high priest. There's no lack. There's no fault in Him. Now if you remember as we looked back, the incarnation of Christ was not only about His substitutionary atonement but also about Him being fitted or being equipped to be a faithful high priest in that he came as a man, the God-man, to suffer in the flesh so that he might be a faithful high priest, so that he might be an empathetic high priest. That he is able to uh, know our infirmities that we have in the flesh and then can then very faithfully and empathetically intercede for us. So it was necessary. But He is fitting for us. He is complete. He is the perfect heavenly high priest. And so then the writer goes on to speak of His completeness, His perfection, as the heavenly high priest. He is holy. He is harmless. He is undefiled. He is separate from sinners. He is higher than the heavens. Now, He is holy. That's why we sing. I try to sing music that goes with the message. Holy, holy, holy. He is holy. In the original language, what in the word that is used here means unpolluted with wickedness. Now, if something is polluted, that means it's not pure anymore, does it not? If I drink polluted water, that means it's not pure water. It's not from a spring. There's some kind of something in it that I would rather not have. But Christ was unpolluted with wickedness. 
He was in the world, but he wasn't of the world. He did not take on the nature of man. He was born of the virgin by the conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he was never polluted with wickedness. He did not have that sin nature. Unlike men, we are all polluted with wickedness. We're all polluted. There's not any of us pure. We have that sin nature. And the ironic priesthood, the line of the Levitical priesthood was polluted. They were not perfect high priests. They were sinful men. And we will see this later on in our study today. We'll be to look at the lives of Aaron and Nadab and Abihu were all of that line and know that they were men that were polluted with wickedness. But the Lord Jesus Christ was, is, still is, holy, unpolluted. The word is also used over in Acts chapter 2 there when uh, Peter was preaching on that message on the day of Pentecost and he quotes a verse here in in, in chapter 2 of Acts and verse 27, he says, For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow what? Your Holy One to see corruption. It's the Holy One. He's always been the Holy One. He always will be the Holy One. Him coming to earth did not change that. The Holy One from the time of His birth to the time of His death in the flesh to the time He went back to be with the Father. And guess what? He's still holy. He's holy. He's not been touched or polluted with wickedness. Not only is He holy, He's harmless. That means that He is without guile. Which means that, in case you don't know what that means, that He is without deceit. He's without craftiness. Never one deceitful or crafty thought or motivation ever crossed through the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that for a moment. We're naturally, I mean, bless little babies' hearts. You don't have to teach them to be deceitful. As sweet and you know, we, 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 we want to say, oh, well, aren't they just perfect? Well, not really. <laughs> now, they're beautiful to us. And I mean, I have a little granddaughter, Anna, and she is beautiful. I'm not saying she looks like a grandfather. She's like her mom. I look forward for that. But she's not perfect. She has that sin nature. Christ never had that. There was never any guile. There was never any deceit. Now, don't ask me about Jesus crying as a baby or something like that. Or, I, I believe that He was a perfect baby. He was perfect. He was never not perfect. But He was without perfect. He was harmless. Without deceit or craftiness. And within the natural sinful man, there is deceit. There is lying. I mean, they go forth from the womb speaking lies, the Scripture says. There's craftiness naturally in them, but in Christ, our high priest, there is none. The Scripture also says here that He is what? Undefiled. Which means that He is unpolluted. We've already talked about unpolluted from wickedness. There's no pollution of wickedness. That he is undefiled, which means unpolluted by sin and the world. Again, no sin nature. All of us are polluted by our sin nature and by the influences of living in a sinful world. We might as well admit to that. We are affected by the wickedness and the sinfulness, not only of our own sin nature, but of the wickedness and the sin of the world that surrounds us. We are influenced by it. We are touched by it. It affects us. Sometimes we submit ourselves to it. That's why the Scripture says that be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's a struggle, is it not, believer? 
It's a battle. But, but Jesus was never influenced by the world around him or the people around him in spite of the fact that he lived in a world of sin and with men and people of sin. I mean, even his own family, his own brothers and sisters were not believing in him. And he had to live with them. He was not affected by those things. He was not polluted by those things. He was perfect. Perfect. I thought of as I was studying this and I thought the scripture came across my mind of 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 21 through 23 it says for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps who committed no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth who when he was reviled did not revile or return when he suffered. He did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Think about the thief on the cross as he was there on the cross. And, and he rebuked the other thief and he says, this man has done nothing amiss. He's done nothing wrong. I think of even wicked Pilate who said to Jesus' accusers, I find no fault in him. A wicked man, he says, I can't find anything wrong with him. Well, that's because there was nothing wrong Amen. to find. 2 Corinthians 5 21 speaks of that he who knew no sin became sin for us. He knew no sin. Hebrews 4 15 speaks of him as being yet without sin. Also, as the scripture here says, separate from sinners. He lived in this world as a man. He walked with mankind in the world. He talked with them, but he was always separate from them. He was always different. He was always different because he was holy. He had no sin nature. There was nothing in him that would make him like other people. He was totally apart from them. He did not think sinfully. He did not act sinfully. He didn't become one of the crowd. You ever have pressure from others to say, oh, you just need to join in the crowd. You just need to think more like the world. Jesus never, ever for one moment thought like the world or acted like the world. He was separate from sinners. Then the scripture says it has become higher than the heavens. What does that mean? It speaks, I believe, of his ascension to the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Remember, after his resurrection, over there in Acts chapter 1, and verse 9, and he told them to wait there for the promise the Father, which was the coming of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 9 it says, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sights. And while they looked up steadfastly toward heaven as he went up. Where did he go? When he went up to the first heaven, the second heaven, above the third heaven, back to be with the Father. Above the heavens. He has gone to intercede for us. That I believe that he did that. Find in Acts 7, verse 56, where Stephen was being stoned and then was being gnashed on with the teeth of those his accusers says, Look, he said, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man, where was he standing? At the right hand of God. In the presence of God above the heavens. No such statement could be made of the Levitical priesthood. Again, pointing out the Hebrew writers, pointing out the superiority that he has to those Levitical priests. They served here on earth in the temple. He serves us. He intercedes for us in the throne room of heaven. Holy, harmless, 
undefiled, eternal. He is in his rightful place above the heavens. Verse 27. Then, what does the writer say? Who does not need daily as those high priests who offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins for them for the peoples. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. See, he is superior to the Levitical high priest because they had to sacrifice before they went in to make sacrifice for the people. They had to go in and make sacrifice for themselves. Go back for a moment. And I've said before, Levit Leviticus is really, it's really a necessary background and, and study to really understand everything that's going on here. Go back to Leviticus chapter 4. Here in verse 3, and there's several passages here. I don't know if I'm going to read all of these, but talking here about the sin offering. And the Lord is speaking to Moses about in verse 2 if a person sins unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord and anything which ought not to be done, does it give them if the anointed priest sins? Bring guilt on the people that let him offer to the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish is a sin offering. You see, they had to, to make sacrifice for their own sins. And then in verse 13, the Lord says, Now if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally, and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and may have done something against any of the commandments of the Lord, and anything which should not be done or guilty, they have to make sacrifice for sin. Go to chapter 9 of Leviticus. And again, what we find in this place is again the necessity of the sacrifice of sin for sinners, for themselves even. Even on the Day of Atonement, we look over to chapter 16. Of Leviticus. It says there the Lord gives very specific instructions about the Day of Atonement. There in verse 3 it says, Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering, of a ram as a bird offering. It says there in verse 6 that Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering which is for himself. And verse 11, and Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself. And then in verse 15, then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering which is for the people. You see, Aaron and those high priests had to make sacrifice for themselves because they were sinners. They were unholy men. But again, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is Christ had to make no such sacrifice for himself because he was already home. And these sacrifices were repeated continually. There was never a final satisfaction. Look over just a couple of pages in Hebrews to Hebrews chapter 9 and verses 7 through 10. It says into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins, committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this that the way to the Holy of Holies, holiest of all, was not yet made manifest. While the first tabernacle was still standing, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who perform the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerning only with food and drinks, various walk offerings and various washing and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. What is the, what's the point there? You go to chapter 10 and verse 1. The law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. What are they saying then? Those priests who offered those sacrifices were not made perfect by those sacrifices, neither were the people made perfect with those sacrifices. 
They were not superior to what Christ did to his priesthood. They were far inferior. But they were necessary as a shadow pointing to ultimately the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the Lamb of God. The perfect sacrifice. But they had to go in year after year, day after day after day, year after year, because it was not perfect. What does the superiority of Christ sacrifice in his priesthood? The latter part of this verse. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Christ made one sacrifice for sins forever. Amen. It was a sacrifice performed once that satisfied the righteous wrath of the Almighty God, His Father. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read verses 10 and 11 of this. In that particular passage of Scripture, note this. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. The one sacrifice of Christ for sins once for all time satisfied God the Father. He was satisfied with that. It did not need to be repeated. This thing, this once for all, is repeated several times here in Hebrews, particularly here in chapter 9 and verse in chapter 9 and, and chapter 10. Look at verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. One time. Verse 26. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 28, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Once for all time. That's what that phrase means. Once, once, once. Chapter 10, verse 10. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once. Chapter, verse 12, that this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. There is nothing else to add to that sacrifice. Never can be, never shall be. And anyone that preaches or teaches, as Paul said, adds to the gospel of this message here that there's something that we're to add to what the Lord Jesus Christ has, has ever done is preaching a false gospel. It's false. Let the Word of God be true. Once, once for all time he has obtained eternal redemption for many for his people this is one reason and I hope that I do not offend anybody but this is one reason why I do not believe that there is going to be any reinstituting of the temple sacrifices when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back there's no going back to that. Amen. There's no purpose in going back to that. Amen. They have served their purpose. They had a good purpose and had a holy purpose, but 
Once the better is here, we don't want to go back to that which is inferior. There is no repetition of His sacrifice for God the Father has already accepted His sacrifice for the people's sins. John 1 and 29, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus said in John 10 and 15, Behold, I lay down my life for the sheep. He's already done it. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 2. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And I thought of that as, as I was reading that verse of Scripture, that phrase in, in the, out of the old rugged cross that says, For a world of lost sinners were slain. Men from every tribe and tongue and nation. He shed His blood for them. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. He was slain. He was slain. The sins of many. And in chapter, verse 5 and chapter 3 of 1 John, what does He say here? And you know that He was manifested to take away our sin. In Him there is no sin. And in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, in this the love of God was manifested toward us. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we love God, but He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He's the only propitiation. He is the only way of salvation. The only sacrifice acceptable to God the Father. What do you see in the world, the world's religions outside of Christianity is that what they teach is some kind of works-based salvation, that there's some way... I can please God and I can get to heaven. There is nothing that you can do to get there. God has made a way, the way, the only way. And that is through the sacrifice and the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, His Son. He offered up, He laid down His life for ransom for many. Then in verse 28, what do we find here? For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness. Those appointed by God in the law to perform the temple duties and sacrifices have weaknesses. They have sin. Remember Aaron? Moses went up on the, the mount. The children of Israel rebelled. They said, oh, let's make us a god. Well, guess who made that god and fashioned that golden calf? It was that. Hmm. Let's think for a minute. Aaron. You want to talk about grace? God had grace on him. I mean, you know, many of us would be thinking, why didn't God kill Aaron? He gave Aaron grace. He gave Aaron mercy. He forgave him. But he sinned in that. About Nadab and Abihu. And offered strange fire to the Lord. They were to change the, the, the worship of God. Yes, but they were not as fortunate as Aaron was. God killed them. They were sinful. God appoints as high priest men who have weakness. And our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, has no such weakness. It says here that the word of the oath came after or subsequent to the law. The oath here is God's oath. And we've read this many times in, in Psalm 110, verses 1-4, through 4, where He is a forever a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now this, of course, we know came prior to time itself. But when Christ died and rose subsequent to the law, in Acts 2, it was revealed that He is the perfect high priest. I'm not saying here that, well, God tried through the law to bring salvation. No. He was saying it became clear subsequent to the law now that He is the high priest and He is the sacrifice and He is the way of salvation. The biblical system was done away with. Let me just say. It's over. It was over. It was done. Peter was preaching, said, don't be looking to the Levitical system anymore. 
more. Christ is the perfect high priest. He's God's high priest. He says here, who has been perfected forever. Now, he's perfect. Perfect from eternity past to eternity future. He was perfect when he came into the flesh. He was perfect. He was perfect. Perfect in his intercession here in the earth and all the earth as he laid down his life for ransom for many. May I say that because of that, he is now fully qualified and enabled to discharge his duties as our high priest. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, there in verses 17 and 18. We covered this, of course, some months ago, but. Therefore, he says, in all things he had to be made like his brother that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. He had to be made like us to be a faithful high priest. It says there, to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people for in that he himself has suffered being tempted. He is able to aid those who are tempted. He, as I said before, empathizes with your infirmities with my infirmities because he suffered hunger he suffered sorrow he suffered thirst he suffered the betrayal of men which all of us probably at some point in time in our lives all of us have suffered these things but he did it without sin and he is able therefore to be able to come alongside of us and comfort us and intercede for us as His children. And then in Hebrews 4 and 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help the Lord Jesus Christ knows that we need mercy. He knows that we need grace. He knows there are times when we need an abundance of mercy and grace and He is able to come alongside of us and give us comfort and give us help and give us mercy and give us grace. Yes, He is our perfect high priest perfectly fitted for us to intercede for us as His children. What does that mean? What does that, what does that mean for you and for me as the children of God? It means that we come to the throne. We come with a broken heart and a broken spirit and a need that weighs down heavy upon us. And he hears us. And he empathizes with us because He is in all points contented like this. You know, when our spiritual broken, He is able to restore us and come alongside us. And when we're going through trials, do you think somebody, and sometimes we go through trials and we think, has God shut His ears to my pleas and to my cries? And the answer to that would be no. He never closes His ears or His eyes. We're always upon His people. Always upon the sheep. We call on Him tonight. Sometimes we want to bear these burdens alone, as the Scripture or the Psalm says. But we should not try to bear our burdens alone. We need to come boldly to the throne of grace for help because we have a perfect and a sympathizing God. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our high priest who hears our prayers, who hears our pleas, comes and pours out mercy and grace upon us in time. I pray that we call upon Him today. That we come boldly
behold unto the throne of Christ, even this day. Heavenly Father, I thank you that, that we can know, we can know that Christ hears us. He hears us. The smallest child truly believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, those simple prayers.